So, you know, your calculators, when you go to your, I'm assuming most of you have Texas Instruments, right? Okay. Right, yeah, we have, we have one outlier here. Um, so, so I think a lot, a lot of the calculators will say like Y1 equals Y2 equals Y3 equals, and that's where you type in the function to graph. Yes? And then what they want here, this stuff has to have, you know, X's in it, right? But if you have something like, you know, X equals sine Y or something like that, and you want to graph that, is there, do you have the ability to do it? And the answer is yes, okay? But here's how it has to be done. What you have to do, and if you have your calculator, I encourage you to do this real quick. Go to mode. And once you're in mode, look at the graphing options. And I believe there's an option somewhere there that says parametric. Or it'll say para or parametric. Do you all see that? Function, pair, pole, yeah, it'll say function. What is it? Pair, pair polar, polar sequence. sequence, right? Something like that. So if you um, do parametric, and then now bring up your, your y equals again, where you go to graph. Now it's going to look different. What does it have here instead of y1, y2? OK, it should have something like this. x1, does it say just x1 or x1t? In parentheses or no? No, just x1t, y1t, then x2t, y2t. Yeah, something like that? OK, so here's the way this works. Let's say that we wanted to graph this function y equals sine x. That's our standard thing. We could use this, right, to do that? Okay, mm -hmm. if we're, we can use parametric by, by doing the following. What we'll do is we'll take x and we'll replace it with t, all right? So now this becomes y equals sine of t. You with me? And the next step we'll do is we'll come over here and we're gonna put this in as a pair. So what do we want our x to be? Our x is going to switch over to t, okay? And what's our y going to be? Our y is going to be sine of t. So we type in sine t, all right? Now, I believe if you hit your, your x key, like your variable key, it, it says like x comma t comma, right? So if you hit that button, it should put the t in there for you. And then when you do that, hit graph, and you should see the sine curve. Yes, I know. I'm saying it's... I realize we could do this with this, right? Like this is nothing new. So when you do this, you should get that same graph, the sine function, right? Those of you who are following me along, are you getting the sine function? Should graph it. Okay, so now it only does one period, right? What, what was your question? Just hit the x variable. Well, I don't know what calculator you got. Did it put t in there? Yeah, that should take it. See if it, see if it goes. Now, it, it only graphs one period. So like, you know when you're doing this, your standard graph, it usually gives you a window, a standard window where your x's go from like negative 10 to 10 and your y's go from negative 10 to 10 or something like that? So for this, what we can do is we can adjust the window on this, but what we do is we adjust the t. So I, if you hit window, you should be able to adjust your t min and your t max. And it's the, the default settings are 0 to 2 pi, I believe. So why don't you change that to like negative 2 pi to 2 pi? And then hit graph again and see if you get two periods of pi. Yes? Okay, now I have not addressed how we're going to graph what you can't graph, right? I just want to make sure everyone can graph the sine curve. Can I proceed? Okay, so what if we want to do this instead? What if we want to do x is equal to sine y? Well, the only difference is that x is now a function of y instead of here y being a function of x, right? So what we'll do here is we're going to replace the y with t, right? The y gets replaced with t and the x becomes sine t. So I want you to go to the graphing thing here and I want on the x2, y2, what are you going to do for x2? sine t, and then what are you going to do for the y2? T. t. Now hit graph.
you should get a sine curve going up the y-axis. It's limited though. It doesn't go any further. Is it supposed to do that? Like it stops. Yeah. Let me see something. Your windows. Yeah, so you can adjust your Y min and Y max here. Oh. Yeah, your X min and X max. So, but, or you can just go to zoom. Uh, let me go back to the graph. You can just like zoom, zoom out, and hit enter, it'll zoom out, or you can zoom in. You can't really see it if you zoom out. Does that make sense or no? Okay, that was just some random stuff that can help you, all right? You can always graph functions of x and functions of y, both on the calculator. You can do them at the same time if you want. Do I need to explain any more? If I wanted to graph that on my calculator, I would go over here and Let's just start over. What would I put in? What would I put in for x of t? Uh, y squared minus y plus 4. T squared, I put in t squared minus t plus 4. And then y of t would just be t. So what we're saying is y is t. I'm going to replace all my y's with t's. And my x is going to be that, that y, which is t, t squared minus. Right? If you do that, it's going to graph a sideways parabola. Now, I suggest that you go back to the other mode if you, you know, want to go back to the regular mode. But parametric is actually, I usually keep my calculator in parametric all the time because you can do both at the same time, basically. We'll talk more about parametric later on because we're going to be doing calculus with parametric curves. So the first thing we have to do is talk about what are parametric curves. So we'll, we'll get back to this, all right? But if you're having trouble with it, that might help. Okay. So last class, we did areas between curves, right? And you had a quiz that you were supposed to do and have for me today. So please turn that in. Have them kind of collect them all at your tables and then pass them. Let's try and get them all to this table. Let's see if we can pull this off. Let's see if we can all get them all onto that table right there. Anyone else? Last call, last call. Okay, thank you. All right, so we talked about areas between curves last class. And, and really what, what was also very important, and I don't know if it came across as being important, is now we have this idea of slicing up areas both vertically and horizontally. When we do our slices vertically, our integral went um, from A to B and it went with respect to X, right? It was DX at the end. When we sliced our areas horizontally, our integral went from C to D and it was always with respect to Y. Did you all catch on to that? That's an important aspect of this as we move forward. We have vertical and horizontal rectangles, one or the other. So now at the end of class, what I did is I tried to prove to you that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, right? But I was just, it was just real quick throwing the idea at you. Now we're going to like formally go through how we find volumes using integrals. So a couple of things we have to remember are just some basic formulas. Like we have, to, we have to know these going in. So the first one is that if you have a rectangular box, the, uh, the technical mathematical name for this is a parallel pipid. Right? If we have a box, then if you know the length, the width, and the height, right, then you know its volume. Yes? Chris, turn in your quiz, please, whenever, if you have it. Um, okay, the next formula we need is the vo volume of a right cylinder. So if we have a right cylinder, 
we know that the volume of this is pi r squared times the height. So the pi r squared is the area of the circle, which is the top of the cylinder, and then the height is just how deep it is. So you're, you're basically to find the volume, you calculate the area, and then you multiply it times the, the depth, right? So these are formulas we've seen. How about the volume of a washer? A washer? Okay, so now we have, it's like a cylinder, but the, the inside's cut out. So for this one, we actually have to, we have to know two things. We have to know what the radius is on the inside, and we have to know what the radius is on the outside. So I'm going to call those R in and R out. Okay, so this would be our radius on the out, and this would be right here our radius on the in. So wouldn't it just be whatever the volume of the whole thing would be, take out the volume of the little piece in the middle, right? So the volume of the outer right cylinder without this taken out would be this, right? Pi times the outer radius squared times height. But then we subtract from that the volume of this little guy in here. So basically what I'm saying is this. You take it you subtract that little guy out of it, and that would be the volume of the washer, right? Okay, so if we use that, we can factor out a pi, and we can factor out an h, and then basically what we have on the inside, right, just out of this formula, factor out your pi and your h, and then what you have is the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, right? Okay. Is this the same picture as, oops, as the one we just did? Oh, yeah, it's hollow. Yeah, it's taller, right? And it's very narrow edges. But I want us to look at it a slightly different way. All right, so stop blinking. All right, so I want us to, to take a look at this and, whoa. Well, you know what? Let's do this. Let's, I'm going to come back to this. I don't, want to, I don't want to do this one right now. We'll do this one later when we're ready for it. All right. So now we talk about something called the method of disks slash washers. So this picture up here is a disk. All right? That's a disk. This is a washer. We are now going to talk about finding volumes of objects using this method of disks or washers. So suppose you take the area between two functions on some interval and you rotate that region about the x-axis. It forms a three-dimensional solid. We wish to determine the volume. See the illustration. So we, we kind of did something like this. This is not the same animation I showed you last time. So here's our, here's our um, area between the two curves, right? And so what we want to do is imagine taking this out into three-dimensional space, right, and rotating just the region around the x-axis. When we go around that region, we're going to create some solid, right? And we want the volume of that. If we look at it from here, it's hard to see that there's, you know, it's hollowed out on the inside kind of, right? So I'm, I can make it somewhat transparent. So you can kind of see what the shape of it is on the inside. We want the volume of this, right? That's the goal. So to do this, what we're going to do, and it's going to be a lot of drawing, a lot of sketching of things, and, and it's gonna, it'll help you, trust me, if you just get used to this. We're going to draw our region, the area we're going to rotate, okay? We're going to draw it. We're going to take a look at one rectangle within that area. And we're going to draw that, and we're going we're to label our axis of rotation, which right now is the x-axis. So we're going to move over to the side, draw a rectangle, draw our axis of rotation. We're going to figure out what this height is from here to here, what this height is from here to here. And then what we're going to do is imagine rotating this around. And when we rotate it, do you all see that we get a... 
washer. We get a washer. Now it's not a great drawing, but do y'all see the washer? And what is the volume of a washer? We just said it was pi times the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, right, times the height. But for us, for us, what's the height? The height's the, the thickness of the washer. So the height for us is always going to be what? dx, okay, so this is going to turn into dx, all right, pi is always going to be there. Now what about the outer radius? In this particular case, it's the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of the washer, right? The distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of the washer, which is the distance from the x-axis to the function f, yes? So this should just be the function f of x squared, right? Outer radius squared minus, now the inner radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the inside of the washer, right? Axis of rotation to the inside of the washer, which happens to be the distance from the x-axis to g, right? So that will be g of x squared. Did you say dx is like the, uh, the little tiny part? Yep. dx has always been the width of this rectangle, right? And what we do is we let that width go to zero in a limit. And that's where that whole, the whole integral comes from. Yes? So that quantity right here, pi, times the quantity f of x squared minus g of x squared times dx would be the volume of that little infinitesimal slice washer thing, right? And then what we want to do is add them up, right? Don't we want to add them up? That's just one washer. So how do we add up an infinite number of these? We integrate. And where will we integrate from? From, from A to B, right? We want our rectangles to move across the region from A to B. So that's, what our, that's where our formula is going to come from. And that's it right there. We're going to integrate from A to B the f of x function squared minus g of x function squared dx, and then the pi, we just brought it out. Now that's the way the, that's the, way the book most of the time will present the formula. I'm not a huge fan of this formula, and I'll explain why, all right? <clears throat> the whole idea here is that we want to be able to find a formula for the volume of a washer, right? The width, I said, was dx, but I, I was very careful to say that we wanted the distance from, the, from here to the outer edge, right? Now, in this particular problem, it happens to be f of x. And the distance from here to the inner edge happens to be g of x in this picture. But as we move on, that will not be the case. It may not be f of x, and it may not be g of x. It may be something different. So what I want you to burn into your brains is you're going to have to generate this formula for each problem each time you do a problem. You have to establish what is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of your um, washer, and what is the distance from your axis of rotation to the inner edge of your washer. I'll illustrate this now with an example, all right? So most of this stuff kind of comes to life after we do one. So we'll start off, uh, start off with something pretty basic, something we can integrate pretty easily. The area bounded by f of x equals x squared and g of x equals x yeah is rotated about the x-axis. Find the volume of the solid formed.
So on, on your next test, when you do a problem like this, I expect to see a bunch of drawings, like a bunch of pictures and illustrate. The answer is not as important to me as the setup of it is, all right? So the first thing I'm going to do for this problem is figure out what region it is that I'm talking about that I'm going to be rotating around the x-axis, all right? So I'm going to draw a picture. So here is x squared. That was f of x. And then g of x was the identity. And the region that we're talking about is this region right in here. Right? That right there. With me? Our axis of rotation is the x-axis, yes? So what, what we like to do with this is we draw these little like curved arrows that kind of shows what our axis of rotation is. And now what I need to do is I need to, to visualize what a single slice, a single rectangle looks like within this picture. So a single little slice, and you know what, I'm looking at this picture now and I'm realizing, you know what, I should have drawn this a little bigger, right? And so if you run into that, you should just start over and draw bigger because we need to identify all these little pieces. So now that I have a general idea of the picture, I will do that. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to just draw mostly the first quadrant. I'm going to really emphasize my parabola over here. That's my f function. And then my g function goes like this. All right, that's g. And now that region is a little easier to see, right? My axis of rotation is here. The region I'm trying to rotate is this. And now I'm going to draw my rectangle. Draw a little vertical rectangle. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this rectangle straight over to the side, right over here. I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to draw the rectangle again by itself. And then I'm going to draw my axis of rotation right here as a dotted line. Okay, so I'm just kind of moving the important information over to the side, but everything is like directly over. Do you all see that? Okay, now I realize that when I wrap that around the x-axis, I'm going to get a washer. So I'm going to draw my washer over here. It does not have to be perfect, okay? You just that's just to let us know, like, we have a washer, right? Don't worry about getting that picture perfectly. But if I'm doing washer, then I know that the formula I need requires that I find an outer radius and an inner radius, right? Outer radius and inner radius. So the outer radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of the, the rectangle. The outer radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of my rectangle. The outer radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of my rectangle. Yes? Three times I've said this. Yes? Okay, now, in this particular problem, that distance from here to here happens to be the distance from the x-axis to the blue function, and the blue function is g of x, right? So that distance is x. Well, g of x is x, right? G of x is x. If you want, just put g of x equals x. Okay, g of x equals x. Okay, now, the distance, my, my inner radius is the distance from my, um, ah, say it again. The inner radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the bottom edge of the rectangle. I'm not going to say that one three times, okay? For this one, what is that distance? f of x equals x squared, right? Okay. I'm also going to just, for the sake of doing it, I'm going to say that this is my r out. This is my r in, right? 
So now we can go straight to kind of like the formula, right? The formula says that the volume of that one little slice, the volume of that will be pi times, I'm too close, volume will be pi times the outer radius squared, right? So that's x squared minus the inner radius squared, which is x squared squared, right? So x to the fourth, and then times the height, which is really the width, right? So that, remember, this width is always dx, so that's dx. That's the volume of one little washer. Yes? One little washer. So what is the volume of the whole thing? Integral? Right. Where to where? Yeah, we have to set them equal to each other. But that one I think we can just do by inspection, right? Zero to one, right? So zero to one. Now pi is a constant. It can come out. And then we have this, x squared minus x to the fourth dx. And I think everyone could handle that integral. Yes? One third x cubed minus one fifth x to the fifth. Plug in one, plug in zero, we get an answer. Okay? Whatever that numerical answer is, did anyone get it yet? Two pi over 15? Okay, two pi over 15. I'll try that, I think. Okay, so that's it. 2 pi over 15 is the volume you would get if you took that region bounded by those two curves and you rotate it around the x-axis. Good? Do y'all, is it, I mean that's kind of hard to visualize what that would look like, like that volume. I can't think of any like object that lo would look like that in real, in the real world. Uh, a it's, it's weird looking. Or a skillet. Or, uh, uh, I don't know. We could debate that. It's it's hard though. It's hard to, yes. So in this example, the bottom of that touched the x-axis. What bottom of what touched the x-axis? Right here. Yeah. Uh huh. It doesn't matter that that happened. Yeah. No, that doesn't matter. Is the only thing that matters is that this blue function always always is the outer radius, and that this one is always the inner radius. When we have our, tr our rectangle all the way down in this corner, right, then basically the height is zero. But at that point, you should have no volume, right? If you take a point and rotate it around, it's still a point. And, but as soon as you move a little bit to the right, there's a difference between the two. So you have something there. That makes sense? OK. Let's do the same problem. Find the area bounded by x squared and g of x equals x or the area, blah, 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 is rotated about, I'm going to change this. I don't want to rotate around the x-axis anymore. I want us to rotate it around, rotate it about y equals 5. Now, I know you, I heard some of y'all say the y-axis. Not yet. We'll do y-axis in a little while. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the picture again. I'm going to draw it here. I know I've got this parabola, com this parabola coming down like this. I know I've got this thing coming like this. It's the same region. But this time, where am I rotating it about? Y equals 5. What is that? It's a y equals 5 is a line, horizontal line, right? So I want to rotate it about, let's see, this is, uh, this is the point 1, 1, right? So 5 is like way up here, isn't it? Now, I'm, I'm not going to redraw it. I'm just going to label it up here. Up here, dotted, y equals 5. That is my axis of rotation. I'm going to take this whole thing and wrap it around that 
all the way around, back through the other side of the board, and come back around. Now, look, are these the same geometric shapes when we do this? No. Absolutely not even close to one another. Like when I rotate this around the x-axis, I get a certain shape, right? Can you visualize, when I rota rotate that around the x-axis, can you visualize, can I put my hand through the center of it? No, no it's going to pinch off right here at the, at the um, origin. Like, I can't put my hand through this object, right? This one, if I ro rotate this around, go through and come back around, I can jump through that, basically, right? Like, I mean, there's a big hole in the middle of it. Does that, do you all see that? <coughs> this depends on you, all right? I can show you some more animations, you know, rotating some things around for you, but, yes? It wouldn't turn into that other triangles area? What triangle? It would, we're still, it would still be that, that sliver? This like sliver, on yes. Top, it wouldn't, like, move what on top? The, like the triangle to the, to the right. This right here? Yeah. This region is not bounded by those two curves. This one keeps going. And that one goes like that, but there's no like cut. There's nothing cutting it off. It has to be bounded and enclosed by the two curves. Yes. Yeah. So I purposely put the axis of rotation outside the boundary, outside the region. I will never give you a problem when the axis of rotation is within the region because. As you can kind of visualize, it, it doesn't make sense. It'll like rotate on itself. And so we always want to have our axis of rotation outside the region. Are you, this okay? I'm going to proceed. I have a, I have a question. Yes. About that. So, like, let me, before you raise that one, oh. um, why, why, could, why doesn't this rotate like this and go like this instead? Why, why is it like that? We're trying to take this entire region and go around the x axis. Right? Oh, I see. You're, you're asking why we don't turn it this way? Turn it so it's like perpendicular to the G of X. To where the DX part of the, the, the rectangle? Uh huh. So that the top is, is like flush with it. Like this? So it's like this. Instead of, instead of like this, it's like this. With like this. T to here? Yeah. But I, I got it. Yeah, uh, the, thing, the, the reason is we have two independent variables, or two variables that could be independent. Either x is going to fluctuate back and forth, or y is going to fluctuate back and forth, one or the other. If we rotate this, then any fluctuation we do when we move back and forth is going to be some combination of changing x and y at the same time. It's much more complicated. It could probably be done, but it's, I think it's not the efficient way. All right, you ready? I'm going to draw a little picture now. What is that? Oh, no, it's all right. You're still interrupting. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I can give you a hard time, right, Chris? Just a little bit. OK, here comes my little picture. I've got my rectangle here, right? Draw a vertical rectangle. Now, the reason why I'm using vertical instead of horizontal right now is because if I were finding the area of that region, I would do vertical. Because these are both functions of x. If these happen to be functions of y, I'd be wanting to use horizontal rectangles. Okay, we are going to address that. I'm just, I want to reiterate why we're using vertical right now. I kind of exaggerated that, I went a little too far, but let me move this over to the side. Here's my rectangle. This is my what? X-axis. This up here is my axis of rotation. Okay. If we rotate that around, we get this washer. It's really kind of like that, right? I, I can't, I'm out of room. I would move that up, okay? Maybe I should move that up. No, I don't because I don't want to erase that. Okay, so my axis of rotation goes through the middle of this. So it's like that little rectangle right there gets wrapped around. Yes? All right, I'm going to label right now my outer radius. My outer radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of the, I'm sorry, axis of rotation to the outer edge of the rectangle. From the axis of rotation 
to the outer edge of the rectangle is this distance from here all the way to here. So imagine you're like standing there, you know, you've got a dotted line, you see this rectangle laying on the floor, right? So you're standing here, you're looking out here. You want to try to find the distance from you, the axis of rotation, to that outer edge, right? Tape measure out to that edge. That's from here to here. See it? Okay? That's our outer. I'm going to label it out. Our out. We'll talk about what it is in a second. And then my inner radius is distance from the axis of rotation to the inside closer edge of the rectangle. This is my in. Now, let's quantify these. What's the outer radius? Anyone know? The distance from the, what do you got? Five minus which function? Okay, so that is correct. So look, remember, the distance, the distance from here to here, right? That distance from the x-axis to that bottom edge is actually this distance from here to here, right? And that's x squared. Okay, so that's x squared. What is the distance from here to here? From the x-axis to the top edge of the rectangle. That's that edge, right? That's x. So if you want to know the distance, oh, and I should put one more distance up here. The whole distance all the way from here all the way down is 5, isn't it? Because that line has been shifted up 5. So if we want to know the distance from here to here, right, it's, it's 5 take away that much. Yes? 5 take away that much would give you this distance. So 5 minus x squared is our outer radius. Do you see why I'm saying you don't want to go memorize a formula? Like each one of these is going to be its own unique sort of situation. Okay, so this outer radius is 5 minus x squared. All right. Who's got the inner one then? 5 minus x. So this time we want to know the distance from here to here. All the way is 5. Take away the blue part, and that's going to be this distance. So 5 minus x. Now we can go to the formula. And I'm, I'm just going to go straight to the integral. The integral is always going to have a pi on the outside. If we're going to be doing this washers thing, we'll always have that. We'll always have a dx on the end because that's always going to be our little uh, thickness or height of our cylinder or our washer. And then uh, our integral will go from 0 to 1 still. Why is it still from 0 to 1? We're still moving this little rectangle back and forth between 0 and 1, right? That, that has not changed. So we've got 0 to 1 there. And now the formula is outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. Outer radius is what? 5 minus x squared, but we have to take that and square it. Then minus inner radius, which is 5 minus x, and then take that and square it, and then that's the integral we want to do. Questions? Yes? The bottom, the bottom edge of our rectangle, no matter where it is, if, if the rectangle is in this region and is drawn vertically, no matter where the rectangle ever is, the bottom edge will always be touching x squared, right? So the distance from here to here is always x squared. The top edge, no matter where I draw the rectangle, will always be touching the top function, which is x. So no matter how I vary this rectangle back and forth, these relationships are always in place. And 5 is always the distance from here to here, right? Like that's not going to change. Yes? Now here's, here's something that's, that's kind of interesting. Let's say we start at the very beginning and our, and our rectangle is at 0, right? Let's say we're at the very beginning and our rectangle is going to start here at 0, right? Because that's where our integral is going to start. All right. If you plug zero in, right? If you plug zero in, what do you get over here? 
5 squared minus 5 squared, and you get 0. So what we're saying is when you take, when you take uh, what this point right here and wrap it around, you should get no volume. And that's because it's a single point, and there's no difference between the functions. But if you go out a little bit, right, there's going to be a difference between those two. Right? If I change, if I go to x, I can't go to 1, because what happens at 1? They pinch off again to nothing, right? So if you plug 1 in here and 1 in here, you get 0 again. But if you take like 1 half, go halfway, this is going to give you a number, this is going to give you a number, and it's measuring the distance you know, from here to here and here to here respectively and subtracting the two. What do you all think? Let's change the problem. Just a little bit. Instead of this, negative 5. So what have I done? I've moved my axis of rotation below the region instead of above it. OK? Let's see how this changes the formula. So I'm going to start with a picture, right? And this is the third time I've drawn this picture. And I know that I'm going to have an axis of rotation below it this time. So when I draw this, I'm going to go like this. This is, uh, yeah, I don't need to label those anymore. My axis of rotation is down here at negative 5. I'm rotating around this axis. I do have good news. All axes of rotation in this class will be vertical or horizontal. You will never, never have to rotate around any line that has a slope to it other than 0 or a vertical line. There are ways to do, you know, slanted line revolutions, but it's beyond the scope of this. And it's not easy. All right, it's, it's complicated. All right, here we go. So what am I going to do? Draw my little rectangle. All right? And this rectangle, again, is arbitrary. Just going to slap it somewhere in between there. And then over here to the side, I'm going to draw that rectangle again. I'm going to draw my x-axis. I'm going to draw my axis of rotation down here. By the way, if you go look in a book or something, you're not going to see any of these pictures. Nothing like this is going to be there. It's, it's, this is, I'm showing you the way that I do this. This is the way that I kind of processed it in my mind when I was you sitting there being taught. I was not shown this. So I just, this is what I've come up with that I think makes the most sense and it's easiest to convey to a student, all right? All right, <clears throat> here we go. The outer radius is the distance from? Nope. In general, the outer radius is the distance from axis of rotation to the outer edge of the rectangle. So again, I'm standing on the axis of rotation. I'm looking at that rectangle. It's laying on the ground over there. I'm trying to measure from me out to that edge. That means from here all the way to here. That's my R out. And then the inner one is the distance from here to the inside rec part of the rectangle. Got it? Now, where do the two function values come into play? We've got the distance. Let me do it in a different color. The distance from here to here, what's that distance going to be? It's x squared. And the distance from here to here, the x-axis, is x. Right? So my, my outer radius is the distance from here all the way to here, right? Which should be what? 
yeah, it's x, right? That's the distance from here to here, right? And the distance from here, I didn't label the distance from here to here. Distance from here to here is 5. We're looking at it as a magnitude. We're not looking at, I realize it's negative 5. But you don't need to worry about all that because everything gets squared inside the formula. So if you're, you know, your radius was negative or positive, it's still in this squaring of the formula doesn't change anything. So we have to look at this as a magnitude, distance. So you said what? X plus five. It's the five plus the X that gives you, t that takes you to the outside. So this is just X plus five. And then what about the inner radius? It's five here and then now just this little piece, so x squared plus 5 or 5 plus x squared. You can do it either way, right? Otherwise, it's the same setup for the integral, right? We're still going to have pi, still going to have 0 to 1, but now this thing changes. x plus 5 squared minus x squared plus 5 squared. Make sense? All right, so this is the first time I'm going to say this, but you'll hear me say this a lot now after this. We are using a method of washers, right? When you use the method of washers, your rectangle is always perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Okay? Washers, your rectangle will always be perpendicular to your axis of rotation. That's for the method of washers. The method of shells, which we have not talked about, is the opposite. Your rectangle will always be parallel to the axis of rotation. So you'll see that as we get into this some more. But I think, I'm wondering if this is sufficient for us to, to move on. I think it is. I think it is. Okay, we're going to change some things here. The area bounded by, I'm going to change these up a little bit. How does this feel so far, just initially? Very visual, right? Mm. Yeah, so let's do this one. Let's, uh, the area bounded by x equals two square root of y and x equals 0, and, x, and y equals 9. Is rotated about the y-axis. Find the volume of the solid formed. Start with a picture, right? Start with a picture. So we got to figure out what this region looks like. So my first picture may not be my final picture. It's just to get a feel for what's happening. All right. X equals 2 root y. What does that look like? What if you plug in 0 for y? What do you get for x? 0. So 0, 0 lives here? What if you plug in 1 for y? What do you get for x? You get 2. So if y is 1, x is 2. 
Understand? What, what if, what's another good number I could plug in for y? Four. four. If y is four, what's x? Eight. I'm sorry, uh, four. Four, right? Two, three, four. That looks like a square root function, right? You can't plug in negative values for y, can you? Can't plug in negative values for y? Because then you have imaginary numbers. Is that good enough? Can I, can I stop there? That's basically what it looks like. x equals 0. What's x equals 0? The y-axis. There's one more curve here that I have to draw. What is that? Y equals, nine. y equals 9. Ah, it's off my graph. Crap. But it's up here somewhere, right? 9. Does that give you a basic idea of what, the, what it looks like? Do you see the region bounded by those three? It's everything in here, right? That's our region. And when we take that region, we want to rotate it around the, the y-axis, right? The y-axis. Well, if we're going to go around the y-axis, right? If our y-axis is our axis of rotation, and the only method we've learned is washers, then our rectangles must be purple perpendicular to our axis of rotation. If our axis of rotation is this, that means the rectangles we draw need to be like this, which means our integral has to be with respect to y instead of x. Okay? So if I draw an arbitrary rectangle in here, I have to draw it that way because washers requires the rectangles to be perpendicular. All right, so that's, that's where I'm headed with this, all right? That's where I'm headed. Now, because I have a feel for what's going on, I'm going to redraw this so I give myself a little more room to put all the little pieces. So you know how just a second ago we were doing vertical rectangles and curves, and I'd bring that rectangle over here, and I'd put our axis of rotation and our x-axis and do my little picture on the side? I want to be able to do the same thing here for this, but it's not going to go to the side. It's going to go below it. So I'm going to move this down and everything else. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to make sure that when I draw, I give myself enough room for this. So here's my, here's my new picture. My new picture is going to go up to 9, OK? And then my little parabola thing is going to go like that. And then my region's in here. Here's my arbitrary rectangle. And my axis rotation's here. I'm not happy with that rectangle. OK, I'm going to translate this thing down now, straight down. Here's my rectangle. And here's my axis of rotation, which simultaneously is also the y-axis, right? Anything else I need there? I'm wrapping this thing around, right? Going like this. So when I wrap it, it's going to look something like that. Now it's a disk, isn't it? It's a disk because, look, this, this edge right here is always touching the axis of rotation. So when I wrap it, I'm never going to have any, any holes in there. So no washers in this. But it's the same thing. Washers and disks are the same formula. <clears throat> Are right, you, you ready to talk about outer radius and inner radius? Outer radius is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer edge of the rectangle here, which is this, right? Do we know that distance? What is it? It's 2 root y. See, but it has to be a function of y, not a function of x, because our, our rectangle is this way now, right? So this is going to be 2 root y. That's the out, outer. What about the inner radius? Well, it's 
this edge, right? But it's always touching the y-axis. That's always zero. Make sense? No matter where you slide this rectangle, this edge is always touching here. So my Rn is zero. That's all I need, right? Oh wait, there's another thing I need. I need limits of integration, right? I'm going to be varying my rectangle up and down through here. Can you tell just by looking what it's going to be? Zero, zero up to nine, right? Zero to nine. Because we're going this way instead of this way. So I should have pi, same thing, integral, zero to nine. Outer radius, right? Outer radius, what? Squared, which would be 4y minus inner radius squared, zero, d y. Super simple integral there, yes? It's, the dotted line is not because of the x equals zero. The dotted line is because we rotate around the y-axis. Let me, I'm going to change the problem now. I'm going to change the y-axis to something else now. We're going to leave everything else the same. All right, there we go. How are we doing on time? All right, I forgot my watch today. Same problem. This time, don't write it, uh, don't write, don't wrap it around there. I want you to wrap it around x equals 10. Same region, right? Same region. On that last problem, the one we just did right there, I just want to point something out. What we're saying that definite integral gives you a number, right? A numerical answer? Like if we would have just started class today with me putting that integral on the board, everyone should be able to compute that, right? It's kind of amazing that that particular integral represents the volume of this weird solid being wrapped around the y-axis, right? But it turns out like that's all it takes. Just if, as long as we can solve that, we can get that volume. It's pretty amazing we can do that. All right, so now we're going to go around x is 10. So my drawing is going to look like this. Um, still this same region. Goes up, comes over. But I'm wrapping it around x equals 10, which is out here. Right, x equals 10 is a vertical line. So my axis of rotation is this. And my rectangle is still this thing, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my rectangle down, my x-axis down. I'm mean, sorry, I just said x. I meant to say axis of rotation down. So I'm bring my rectangle straight down, my axis of rotation, bring it down. And I'm also going to bring my y-axis down. So when you try to move this over, just bring, bring everything except the curves, basically. So what distance am I interested in? Let's, 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 let's see. Where are y'all? Where are y'all? There you are. Where are you? Michelle is up. So my question is, um, you're looking for the outer radius, right? I'm kind of le um, leading you with that, yes? So the outer radius is the distance from what to what? The furthest side of the rectangle from the axis of rotation. Okay, so the furthest side away from the rectangle and the axis of rotation. So that would be from here to here? Okay, so this, I'm just going to label it as being your R out. And do you have an idea of what that is? 